Hello, and welcome to another episode of Outlier Founders by Outlier Academy, where we decode what iconic founders and entrepreneurs have mastered, from how they've built their companies to the frameworks and strategies they use, and the lessons they've learned along the way. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Emmy Gall. Emmy is the founder and CEO of Ezra, where he's focused on bringing affordable and fast cancer screening to everyone. Since founding Ezra in 2018, Ezra has managed to bring down the cost of MRI cancer screening by 80%, and the time required to get your body scanned by 66%. And they're not done. They think they can get it to nearly 90%, all by harnessing the power of AI and machine learning. Listen as we decode everything from the incredible technology behind Ezra's approach to cancer screening to why magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is the right technology to screen for cancer, how Ezra has built a capital light business in deep tech healthcare, and why the cure for cancer already exists. It's just not evenly distributed yet. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper into the topics we cover at outlieracademy.com slash 146. That's outlieracademy.com. Com slash one four six. Please enjoy my conversation with Emmy Gall. Emmy, thank you so much for joining me on Outlier Founders. Um, I'm thrilled to have you on to talk about Ezra. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's great to be here. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today, and, and shortly we will break down what Ezra is. But I want to start with your background because you have, I think, a pretty particularly interesting uh, background. And obviously, Ezra is the second company that you've started. So give us just a quick sketch of your background kind of up to founding Ezra. Absolutely. So uh, I'm originally from Romania. Uh, I studied computer science and applied mathematics in uh, Bucharest. And uh, while I was in college, I started a software company. Uh, basically. You know, didn't have any money, wanted to make some money and started a software company with a bunch of friends in college who uh, were also programmers. And initially, we just started building software for others uh, in the US and Europe. That turned out to be a really good business at the time. And then we used the cash to launch our own product. And we had this idea to launch a video ad server, uh, which back in 2008, 2009 was a great idea because video was very new on the internet. That company led me to London. I spent seven years in London, and then it was acquired by a large um, ad tech group in New York City. And the reason I'm, I'm giving you that context is because because of my experience with Brainia and made some money, I started volunteering for a nonprofit in Romania called Hospices of Hope, who build and operate hospices that care for cancer patients. And in being involved with them, I realized that the main reason why people end up in a hospice due to cancer is because they found cancer late. And the main reason we still find cancer late for people is because there's no way to screen for cancer everywhere in the body that's fast, accurate, and affordable. Um, and so decided to, to focus on that problem and had some um, you know, cancer experience in, in my own family. My, my mother sadly passed away from cancer. So kind of very, very motivated by, uh, by this mission, uh, went on to... Um, do a couple of years of research and then and then start Ezra. I want to talk about those couple of years of research because you know you did something relatively unique there, where you obviously identified a problem, uh, or you know the way I like to think about it, like you identified a very large and interesting problem space. You had a very clear idea of what you wanted to do or what you where you needed to move the needle in order to change some of the outcomes. But then you went through this process of like an exhaustive list of the different ways you could solve the problem and trying to eliminate them. Talk about that and, and kind of how why you landed on the. Uh, approach that you landed on with Ezra? Yeah. So I actually, uh, Ezra in the current iteration was the 12th uh, idea or iteration of how you could go about screening for cancer. And after setting on, on, on this as the problem, I basically went through all of the different ways in which you could attack the problem. And I had some crazy ideas like, you know, DNA-based nanobots that you put in the bloodstream that would kind of beam data to a Bluetooth device and whatnot. I mean, that sounds fascinating for like 2040. <laughs> it, is, it, it is. And I actually met with a couple of scientists who were working on DNA-based nanobots um, and concluded very quickly that the, the technology is way too early to be able to use it today. And really my goal or one of my criteria for choosing a solution was it has to be something that can be used today where you, with technology, you could make it better and more accessible. And so I cycled through about a dozen ideas. And then actually, 
on my honeymoon, this is in November of 2016, December of 2016, I was reading a paper that was comparing MRI scans with other types of imaging, like such as uh, CT scans, ultrasound, and so on, in terms of the sensitivity and specificity for detecting cancer. Early. And he was concluding overwhelmingly that MRI has higher sensitivity, higher specificity, and on top of that, it doesn't expose you to ionizing radiation. So settled on MRI as one of the solutions um, that you could apply to detect cancer early. However, MRI has a big issue, which is it uses magnetic resonance of the protons in the water of your body to create internal images of the body. And because it uses magnetic resonance, it's very noisy. And so to do an MRI scan, you generally need to do the same scan multiple times because signal will always be the same, noise will always be random. And by doing it multiple times, you can average out the noise, the randomness of the noise. And so with my computer science hat on, I was like, well, we can probably create machine learning models that identify what noise looks like and remove that noise without having to do the scan multiple times. So decided that MRI can be applied to this, um, built a prototype initially focused on prostate cancer screening using MRI, launched that. It was very successful. And then we launched our full body MRI in 2019. And uh, we've since scanned a few thousand people and uh, found potential cancer in 13% of our members. Uh, almost every week we find something for uh, for members uh, right now. Wow. I mean, that's amazing outcome, just even the size of that already with the, with the you know, the number of, of patients that you're treating, a number of customers that you're treating. So, you know, just to try to parrot that back, because it is a lot to wrap your head around, you know, as I was, you have, had an initial conversation with you and then I was preparing for this, there's a, there's a lot here. So just to kind of parrot it back, you know, Ezra is, you're focused on cancer screening, cancer detection early. You're trying to bring down the cost and, and, and obviously increase the accessibility, to, you know, kind of cost is a major barrier to accessibility. And then you're taking an existing technology that's MRI, and then you're kind of adding on to that, obviously, a software layer that's AI using a lot of machine learning. And you're using that to effectively, I'm guessing, up the imagery in some, in some regards or strip out some of the noise. Yeah. So we actually apply AI to all of the spectrum of screening. So there, there are three big cost centers to getting screened with a full body MRI. There is the scan itself, there is the radiology interpretation, and there is the report generation uh, for the person to actually understand what the interpretation means. And we actually, that's why I use AI across the, that entire spectrum. You know, make the MRI scan faster, make the interpretation faster, and make the report generation faster. In our case, the report generation is actually automated. We take radiology reports and we automatically using AI. Uh, turn them into Ezra reports that then get reviewed by a medical provider and sent to members. So our thinking is that machine learning can be used to decrease all of the cost centers, so the cost of, for all the cost centers in order to make our scan more affordable and then pass all of those cost savings to consumers. Yeah. I want to talk about, you know, one of the things I find very helpful is just comparing and contrasting. And, you know, we're going to go into later in this interview aspects of your model that I think are really interesting that are effectively allowing you to take this MRI technology, make it available in a way that it's never been available, make it affordable in a way that it's never been affordable. And so I think it'd be helpful to just start with a comparison. And so obviously you talked about that today, cancer screening is, uh, you know, it almost sounds reactive. It's something that you don't do proactively. And so you're typically, you're feeling ill or you're or, you know, maybe just randomly for something else, they're doing an MRI and they end up finding cancer. Talk about, I guess, what a, I don't know, or paint a picture of today, how it w- would work to try to screen for cancer if someone's not using Ezra or what that process usually looks like. Yeah. So every year, about 20 million people will be diagnosed with cancer globally. Half of these individuals will be diagnosed late. Uh, this means that they have a symptom. They went to the doctor, the doctor said, oh, let's do a scan, and they would do the scan, and they had metastatic colon cancer with expansion to the liver. Um, And that's 10 million people every year. Now, the reason this happens is because about 50% of cancers don't have any screening guidelines. If you're fortunate enough to get, and I say fortunate, you know, quote unquote, but if you're fortunate enough to have breast cancer, you will likely be able to find it early because you can get a mammogram every year if you're a woman 
which is very good for finding breast cancer early. But if you are unlucky enough to get pancreatic cancer, you're not going to know until you're symptomatic and you will only be symptomatic most of the time when it's expanded beyond the pancreas. And that means that your five-year survival rate will be in the single-digit percentages. Now, what we're saying at Ezra is actually there are ways to find uh, these cancers early. And actually, if you pull together the prevalence for all of the cancers we screen for at Ezra, we have similar prevalence for people over 40 as breast cancer or lung cancer. Like, you know, breast cancer is, a, I want to say, 20% prevalence in women over 40. If you pull together the 13 organs we screen for at Ezra, we have a 20% or so um, uh, prevalence. And so what we're trying to do is to find cancer early because five-year survival rate for early-stage cancer is about 80% compared to only 20% for uh, late-stage cancer. I want to talk for a second about MRI technology um, because I think, you know, just to try to describe it for people, I'm going to try to string together a couple of ideas and then we kind of dive into this. But one of the things I thought was so fascinating is, you know, I want to talk about why MRI was the right tool. And you talked about specificity and uh, one other piece of this. Yeah, sensitivity. That's right. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I think is really interesting is one, this is an existing technology and you guys aren't making hardware. So you're effectively saying we're going to take advantage of the technology, but we're not going to focus on manufacturing the hardware. We're not going to become experts at making MRI machines. We're going to become experts at basically layering this technology with really interesting software where we can effectively like supercharge the technology. That is, it's a very interesting, very provocative idea. How did you land on that? And I guess talk about why that model makes sense. Yeah, so I landed on on MRI the, first and foremost because it is the only high resolution medical imaging modality that does not expose you to ionizing radiation. You know, so you do it you often. Go, so you can do it every year for the you can do it every day for the rest of your life, wow. and wow. you will be fine. Unlike a low dose CT or an X ray or mammo, where you expose yourself to degrees of of radiation. Not to say that they're not good modalities, because if you're at high risk for breast cancer, you should get your mammogram despite the marginal exposure to radiation that you'll undergo. So the main reason I chose MRI was because it is, uh, you know, completely safe to do um, for individuals. The second reason is it has this very high sensitivity and specificity. For those you know, who are listening, who don't know sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity is how sensitive is the test? Like if I get, if I have cancer and I get tested, how likely am I to find it? You know, how, how sensitive is it? Specificity is if I find something, how likely is it to be the disease that I'm looking for? In our case, cancer. And so when you're looking at a screening test, you're looking at sensitivity and specificity, and there's always a trade-off between the two because the higher the sensitivity the lower the specificity and vice versa. You know, think of it as a car alarm. You know, the more sensitive your alarm, the more it'll go off. That means they will also go off when there's noise on the street, not someone trying to steal your car. And so MRI has incredible sensitivity. You know, we're talking 96, 97% sensitivity if you look at kind of third-party data. It has an average specificity, let's say about 80%, which means it has an inherent 20% false positive rate. And our stance is that while incidental findings can be an issue with screening, if you manage them well, actually, the only reason why some people survive pancreatic cancer is because they found it incidentally. And so what we're trying to do at Ezra is find all of these incidentals and determine which ones are actionable and which ones aren't. Uh, And we've built a whole suite of tools to, to do that. Coming back to your original question, we have layered a lot of software to make what we do more accessible. Before Ezra, you could get a full body MRI, but it would take two to three hours. It would cost $10,000. With Ezra, it takes 60 minutes. It costs $2,000. And we are working on making it even more affordable in, in the very near future. 
I mean, that's already a massive, massive, massive improvement. <laughs> I mean, you've, incre- you've taken the time down by two thirds. You've taken the amount of money down by four fifths, you know, 80%. Um, it's, it's a massive change. One of the things I, I want to now dive into and try to kind of structure this conversation around a couple of, you know, big ideas. And obviously one that, I, that we talked about before that is very clearly present in what you're trying to do at Ezra is take something that, you know, as we've described, this is typically most cancer screening today is reactive. So you have symptoms, there's something bad that's going on. And now, you know, it's, I don't know, a, a bad analogy might be your car's now making noise and, and you're like, something is not right. So now let me take it into the shop. Well, of course, they're going to find something. It may not be great, <laughs> maybe kind of at the catastrophic phase. And you're trying to, you know, change something that's reactive into something that's proactive. And, and one of the things that, you know, I've had a lot of conversations like this. Andrew uh, Hur at Fount is, is one of them. We have had the team on from Levels. And, you know, there's a big change going on right now just in terms of healthcare where it is changing from reactive and all the powers held by doctors to proactive. And you as the consumer now are empowered to, if you so decide, go and decide to do this. And so there's something very powerful in what you're doing of just saying, hey, cancer screening or just looking at, at your body and seeing how you're doing, you have every right to do it. If you have the money and you're willing to spend it, you know, come and, and do that at Ezra. Talk a little bit about that and, and why that's an important shift. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of, uh, there's this book that was written by uh, Eric Topol. It's called um, The Patient Will See You Now. I think it was uh, Dr. Topol was one of the first doctors to propose the future of healthcare being one in which it is patient driven as opposed to health system doctor driven. The way I think about it from the perspective of Ezra and what we do you know, we have the cure for cancer already. It's early detection. You know, that's it. Like we know how to treat cancer really, really well if it's early stage. And the survival rates in some instances are like 90, 95, 99%. Only if you find it early. So the cure is there. We just need to find it early. To find it early, we need to be proactive. To be proactive, we need tools that are affordable, fast, accurate, and so on. And so I'm a huge believer in this kind of whole new trend of companies such as Ezra, such as Found, and so on, that are trying to prevent issues from happening before they happen. In the case of Found, you know, they really focus on enhancing performance and making sure that you don't get to even have disease. But if you get to have disease, what we focus on is detected early because that's when it's most likely to, you're most likely to have a really strong chance at remission or, or becoming cancer free or disease free. Yeah. I mean, this idea, you know, we talked about it, um, you know, before this interview, this idea that the cure is already here and it's early detection, I think is, you know, seems diametrically opposed to how most people are thinking about cancer, which is cancer is this thing that's going to be cured by healthcare companies. And at some point in time, there's going to be drugs and certain things you can take. And it's like, no, it's not actually real. It's a biological process. You just need to find it early. And to find it early, you have to take down the friction and take down the barriers. Um, I love that idea. It just seems incredibly, almost criminally under discussed. <laughs> is insanely under discussed and actually a big chunk of the medical community is still going like oh yeah you don't want to look at things because you're always going to find things and the point we're we're trying to make is that is fine let's find all of the things and then do a really really good job in only following up on the things that are clinically significant you know i think a lot of doctors are concerned about oh we're, we're just going to buy up see so many people with so many things but the thing is, most of these things that we find never get biopsy. You know, they get tracked over time or you at most you do the follow-up diagnostic scan and then you just monitor things and see how they, um, they evolve. And so I think there needs to be a paradigm shift in how we think about disease and, and cancer towards early detection. And, um, you know, with cancer, especially the unfortunate reality is you can be a you know, a vegan triathlete and still get cancer because it's a genetic disease. You know, there are lifestyle factors that can impact it, but it can be just like you're unlucky. You have a series of genetic mutations that lead to an oncogene, that lead to a group of cells, that lead to a tumor, that lead to uh, uh, an organ being um, filled with cancer, that lead to expansion, then metastatic disease. And so what you want is to give yourself the best 
defense. And the best defense is a look inside your body. Yeah, I mean, one of, you, you you hinted on it there, but one of the big things, obviously, that we talked about before is, you know, if you get a scan and it is stuff that is not significant, you also then at least have a baseline to which you can compare so that the next time you get a scan, you can actually look at deltas as opposed to, again, and but this all requires that you're proactive, that it's something you do somewhat routinely. Um, and so it does require this this shift. I, I want to talk about one more thing. You know, so we talked about, um, and, I, and I'm very excited to check out this book, The Patient Will See you now because it's exactly about this obviously massive power dynamic shift that I think has to happen in healthcare in order for outcomes to really change. But the other piece of this too is just ownership of your own health. And it seems like we're going something, we're going through a massive, you know, generational shift. I would almost think about it as I look to the doctor as the person who's in charge of my health to know I'm in charge of my health. And it's my, you know, you just look now at all the wearables, all the amount of supplements, all the amount of kind of biohacking, you know, even just look at stuff like eight sleep and or a ring and an Apple Watch, you already have much more data around your health that's not resided in, held private inside your HIPAA files that all your healthcare providers have, you know, and so you manage it. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, just go a little bit deeper on is, you know, and I brought this up to you when we were talking about this interview is, so I, I started digging into obviously Ezra. And one of the things that honestly shocked me a little bit was you sharing on social, your experience of going into Ezra and getting a body scan and literally having this massive backlash of basically doctors coming and saying, oh, this is terrible. And the commentary that they had around it was, this is an expensive machine. Uh, you know, almost like you, sh- you, you and no one else should be allowed to use this expensive machine unless the doctor says so around control. The other one was uh, it's prohibited prohibitively expensive. Obviously, what you're trying to do down is drive down the cost. And so it's only this good that's only some people can have. And the second one was around, you know, these incidental findings. But I thought it was just staggering the amount of backlash where they weren't acknowledging any of the positives and were just completely focused on the negative. What was that experience like for you? And is that something you come up a time and time and time again with just doctors in the medical establishment? Yes. So it's a great point. And I have like, it's, it's a great question. When I started Ezra, I used to come across that in four out of five doctors that I spoke with. A year and a half, two years in, it was like four, three, three out of five. Now I want to say it's maybe two out of five, maybe even one out of five doctors that we speak with are have like significant kind of allergic reaction to it. And I think what it is, is doctors want to be on the cautious side for good reason. You know, it's kind of like they are there to first do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath. And their concern is legitimate in that, hey, if I'm going to do this scan and biopsy a shit ton of people, this is a net, you know, negative thing for, for society, which is true. But the thing that they didn't appreciate is actually you find a bunch of stuff, you don't need to biopsy any of it, you know, and then you just follow up with a diagnostic scan or track the thing over time and see how it evolves. And only after a positive diagnostic scan do you then go and and biopsy people. And a lot of doctors that work with Ezra have seen that now over, you know, the, the, the two, three years that we've been live. And I've become not from from kind of being reluctant to getting a scan. They've become proactive about uh, sending people in. And I actually have a, a very specific example. Won't, won't name name, but we have a doctor who was skeptical. Who then we did this research project, and he decided he's going to try it out himself and scan his family. And we found a brain tumor in his. I want to say 17 year old daughter. And it turned out to be a, a significant thing. Uh, she had it removed and she's now perfectly fine. And he became, you can imagine, like a, a big proponent of it because, like, the probability of his daughter having a brain tumor at that age was just like any doctor would have said, oh, you know, probability is so small, you don't need to do a scan. And so we've seen doctors embracing it more. And I think. As with any new technology, it's going to take time for the early adopters and then the early majority, late majority, and so on to adopt it. And I'm playing the long game and definitely working on publishing data and working on you know partnering with doctors and working on showing that this thing helps people find cancer early and, and survive. 
I want to talk about that particular, you know, kind of example, because one of the, you know, in my mind, one of the things coming into this interview that I don't even know where I got this idea was that, oh, okay, so if we are changing from this world where MRIs are reactive and turn out it's proactive and, and it's something that you want to do. Well, I think about myself again, I'm 36 and I'm like, okay, probably makes sense at my age, but that's a fascinating example where you have a 17 year old who I don't know if anyone would have said, oh yeah, we should get, you know, people as young as 17 to go inside an MRI and go and get scanned. So I guess one of the questions is just, and we only scan adults, by the way, like that was a research project. It just happened, but, uh, which was like, it was fortunate for, for, for that, that, an yeah, incredible outcome well. in that case. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so one of the questions that I just wanted to ask you just super generally is like, what are the guidelines or what do you encourage in terms of how people think about scanning? Because it may be obviously just in that example alone, it's like, I'm probably completely wrong to think that you wait until, you know, you wait until later on in life to do scanning. How do you think about it? How do you encourage patients to think about it? Yeah. So we believe it should be the consumer's prerogative, whether they should get scanned or not. Uh, with a, an MRI because it's a safe modal modality. If you're 20 and you want to get a scan, you should be able to get a scan. And we've certainly have men, had have had many people who uh, were young and not at high risk who um, uh, who got scanned. The interesting thing is when you speak with doctors, they go like, "Oh, well, you know, before uh, under 40, the probability of uh, cancer is so low that it doesn't make sense to get screened." But yet, 150,000 people in the United States every year are under 40 and they find cancer, you know, symptomatically, which means their cancer had existed for a while. So, you know, tell that to the guy who's, you know, 28 and just found out he had pancreatic cancer and that they shouldn't get scanned. You know, you can't. And so we think that what is best for the individual is best for the individual and the individual should have the freedom to choose. And the individual didn't have the freedom to choose until recently. And I'm actually excited that Ezra is one of the companies that is able to provide that freedom to the people. <laughs> Well, yeah. And it's not just democratizing access. It's doing it in a way that's bringing down the cost and bringing down the time requirement, which is truly what needs to happen. Because again, I think just to like connect it to a larger picture, I forget what conversation what this, you know, that this was, but I've learned a lot about healthcare and some of the statistics just around annual inflation. I think this was from Adrian uh, Aonan from, uh, from Forward was talking about, you know, that I think today, even if you look at the healthcare costs in the US, it's something staggering. It's like 30% of GDP is spent just on 18% on GDP. 18% yeah. on GDP. And it's, I think it's headed to 30. Yeah. But one of the other most surprising things is, you know, and this is not, uh, this is not shocking, but it, so if we think that that's growing, it's actually the, uh, there's inflation embedded in healthcare costs and it's rising at eight or 9% year over year. And we're talking about that now at an economy wide level and shocked that inflation is eight or 9%. Yet here it is in healthcare and it's been happening for decades now. And so you guys are truly, you know, bringing deflationary forces into at least a small area of healthcare where we need that little Literally across the board, <laughs> across the entire service. Area. And here's a staggering statistic, Daniel. 80% of the 18% of GDP, so 80% of healthcare costs are managing, are, are attributed to managing end of life chronic care in the last three to six months of one's life. So we're spending 80% of our budgets in extending life by three to six months. We should be spending 80% of our budgets in preventing or detecting early so that you extend life by five years, 10 years, 15 years, not three to six months. Yeah, no, it's very well said. I mean, that's a shocking, it's a shocking stat. <laughs> when I found out, I was, I was, I was shocked. Well, yeah. And you combine that with other things. One of the data points that, you know, I uncovered in another conversation recently was that, you know, right now in the US, I think, and I think this data is somewhat old, I think it's around 2016, there's around 72,000 people that were centenarians and that's expected to be over a million by the year 2050. And so you think that if today 80% of healthcare and 18% of GDP is because of end of life, that's going to absolutely explode when you have this order of magnitude explosion in that population. I want to talk about uh, MRIs, but I, I want to talk about the patient experience. And, you know, so, I'm someone who I have never gotten an MRI. You talked about before, it's a noisy. I imagine a lot of people probably have a general apprehension or just, you know, just because they've never done it before. They don't even know what it's like. So I'd love it if you could kind of talk through what is the, what is it like to go and get an MRI? How long does it take? What do you have to do? What are the steps? And just walk people through that to kind of give everyone a sense. Yeah. So 
the way Ezra works is you were direct consumers. So you go on Ezra.com, you sign up for the type of scan you'd like to get. And we have various different types of scan with our full body MRI being the kind of stable product. You, uh, that choose where you want to get scanned. And we have about 17 partner imaging facilities that are kind of hand curated uh, uh, imaging facilities that are very high quality in locations where um, we scan and we're live in six cities. And you then visit this facility and you get a scan. It's a 60 minute scan. It is longer than, than you'd want to be in a scanner. It really is. I will, you know, uh, if you're claustrophobic, especially, it's not a pleasant experience. I will say we've had members now who've done it multiple times in, in subsequent years. Once you've done the first one and you see what it's all about and you get used to the length of time you're in there and so on, it gets easier. But the first one is certainly you know hard, especially if you've never done, done MRI before. In my case, I've now done dozens of MRIs. I was actually the guinea pig for our very first scan, which was three and a half hours when we were kind of working on this. And uh, I find it meditative because like you have no phone, you have nothing. You're just in that machine, uh, you know, and the easiest thing you can do is just breathe and, and meditate. So you get your scan and then five to seven business days from having gotten your scan, you receive your Ezra report, which is a radiology report that walks you through every single finding and a translation of what the finding means. So we don't tell you just like unremarkable parenchyma. I don't know what that means. We translate that for you. And then you can have a video uh, call with a medical provider who's an employee of Ezra who will guide you through your findings, give you an action plan and uh, next steps if there are any. There will be next steps even if there's no cancer. Like we sometimes find fatty liver disease Fat, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that can lead to cirrhosis, which can lead to like other types of issues, including potentially cancer. You can actually reduce your fatty liver content by doing exercise, lifting weights, etc. So we tell you what you should be doing based on your SRO report. And then um, uh, you can have a follow-up call with a Lesra medical provider six months in just to check in and see how things are going. And then especially over 40, we do recommend that people do it annually. The fatty liver, you know, is a really interesting example where that you're not, so you're screening for cancer, you end up finding a fatty liver, and then you can obviously help that person, give them advice and coaching around what to do there. Does that happen for, I mean, this is probably a weird question or it's, a, you know, and I have no idea uh, what this is, which is why I'm asking, you know, do you find that for other organs? Like, do you ever find something to do with the lungs that may suggest someone doesn't have enough lung capacity or something to do with the heart? What do you find that you're not looking for <laughs> besides fatty liver? Yes. So we, we find all sorts of things that are uh, not cancer that might be clinically significant. So we often find disc herniations because our scan includes the spine. And so we find disc herniations, which if they're asymptomatic, you don't need to do anything about it. But if your lower back has been hurting and, you know, you can barely stand for five hours and so on, now you know why, you know, you have a disc herniation that maybe needs some physical therapy, some exercise, etc. We find aneurysms. You know, aneurysms are important to know about because they can pop. And if they do, you want to know why. We find hernias. Hernias, you know, again, if they're asymptomatic, they're fine. But if they're symptomatic, you now know why, you know, your abdominal area has been hurting or, or whatever. So we have tens, if not hundreds of types of findings. And what we've done is we've created this AI that takes every single one of these findings converts it into a translation of what it means and what you should do about it. And then we put that into the Ezra report that you receive. So we're very focused on cancer, but you get significantly more value than just screening for cancer from doing an Ezra scan. I want to go a little bit deeper into AI. And, you know, part of this is, um, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask is, so you guys have managed to take an existing technology, MRI technology, and significantly drive down costs and significantly drive down time. And I imagine maybe part of that is because you're very specifically looking at a, you know, for very specific things. You're, you're checking for, I think, now tens of different types of cancers that you guys can spot. 
Am I getting that that right? Or is the AI that you guys have designed, would, would it be able to broadly bring down the cost and the time required for an MRI? And I guess what I'm trying to get at there is like, was AI the right solution here because you're looking for something very specific? It, or it, and is it a bad general purpose way to try to drive down time and cost? Yeah, so the answer is both. Our, our kind of first effort in decreasing scan time is that we designed a recipe for scanning that was tailored for screening. And that by itself helped us reduce scan time from like three hours to like one and a half hours. And then we layered in AI to accelerate the scan time even further. And then we layered in AI to accelerate the interpretation time even further and so on. So our, our stance with machine learning is that it can be used to automate things or to enhance things. And our, we're, we don't think ourselves as, a, as a, an AI company. We think, our, think ourselves as a cancer screening company that leverages AI to decrease the cost of cancer screening. And can talk about a lot of uh, too much, but next year we have some stuff launching that will significantly decrease the cost even further from uh, from the current levels, which are already pretty good from 10,000 to 2,000. One of the other questions I want to ask is, you know, probably I, like a lot of people listening, have heard a lot about AI. And yet I, at least, you know, for myself, haven't, haven't worked at a company that has, you know, you, as you guys say, y- yes, a, you know, developing AI is not the mission of the company. De- you know, you want to uh, make it much, much, much easier, much more affordable, much faster for people to screen for cancer. But AI seems to be the right tool. And so one of the th- questions I wanted to ask you is, what what has it taken for you guys to be world-class at AI. And I guess what I'm curious there is everything from what does the team look like to how is this different? How is running, how is, you know, building AI software maybe different than software you've built previously? Yeah, so AI, especially in healthcare, boils down to one thing as being the most important thing, which is data. You know, the neural net that we use at, at Ezra is not state of the art, you know, uh, reinforcement learning, which is kind of the, the, the most, uh, uh, popular stuff you see these days in, you know, in, uh, in DALI and stable diffusion and so on. But the value of what we've built at Ezra is all in the data. We have what we think is the largest data set of, uh, full body MRI images out there. We have created internal processes for curating data sets for training AIs. We have internal teams that are responsible with running what's called verification and validation for AIs. When you create an AI and you want to put it in production, you need to have it cleared by the FDA. To do that, you need to validate that the AI works on your intended population, on the types of magnets you want to scan on, et cetera. So we have an incredible team at Ezra and, and partnerships that allow us to acquire all of this data that we need in order to validate AIs. So I think in building AIs in healthcare, the data component is the limiting factor. And we have a huge advantage at Ezra because we have a lot of data and we have a lot of process internally on how to acquire this data. So from a, from a team structure perspective, because you asked about that, we have a, a, an incredible scientific officer who kind of leads our, especially our MR team, who is the inventor of parallel imaging in MRI, Dr. Dan Sodickson, who's the vice chair of radiology at NYU. I think he's now chief scientific officer at NYU, that's his title. And then he also spent part time with, with Ezra. They have a team of AI engineers, we have a team of AI infrastructure, we have a team of regulatory affairs, uh, and we have a team of operations. And all of these teams work together to acquire the data to train, train AIs, iterate on the AIs, acquire the data to validate, validate, write 900 pages, submit to the FDA, get clearance, and and then move on to the next one. So it's kind of the biggest surprise for me in building AIs for uh, healthcare is how much time is actually spent on data, more so than uh, the neural nets themselves. Yeah. 
I imagine obviously the, um, you know, having to get FDA approval and having the regulatory aspect is obviously very unique as well, too. You know, you, you, you alluded to it, I'm sure being completely serious that you do need a 900 page report that's going to the FDA. Exactly. Like a, a, a report that you submit to the FDA for clearance is roughly 900 pages. So if you were to try to estimate, you know, um, and not that this can go away, and that's it's a bad thing that if you're building technology and AIs in healthcare, that it needs to go for validation and testing to some external third party. That's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it is. But, you know, if you were to think about the pie chart of how much time you guys spend on AI, what percentage of that is dedicated to just managing the regulatory aspect? You know, frankly, not not a ton. Like it's it's I've actually been very positively impressed by the FDA and the quality of people at F, the FDA. They really know what they're doing. And having a body that's external, that's unbiased, that's focused on protecting consumers, uh, so like with safe and effective devices, creates a really useful forcing function for companies because you really need to get all of your quality management in place processes in place, validation in place, and so on. And so having the FDA as the regulatory body that we need to submit to whenever we create one of these AIs is actually internally for us really, really useful because it forces us to get all our ducks in a row. And so we would have to spend all of this time to run VNV and so on, regardless of whether we filed with the FDA or not, it so happens that filing with the FDA creates a really clear kind of business reason to to invest in all of those processes. So I know it sounds odd, but I've actually quite enjoyed the process of working with the uh, government body like the FDA because I can see the value of putting out there a device that's safe and effective. Well, and, and as you said, I mean, it, it, you know, it kind of raises the bar for rigor internally with which you're doing these testing, with which you're kind of distilling down and making decisions and deciding what to do and what not to do. Exactly. I, I want to talk about one more aspect of your business that, um, and, and I'm curious whether it was intentional or not. I imagine it was. Um, but one of the things that's kind of fascinating when I think about Ezra is, so you guys are, you're focused on cancer screening. The, you know, you're, the main thing that you're investing in is the software, the AI, the technology that you're using to basically process and, uh, you know, uh, detect cancer and actually be able to figure out what to do. And so by nature of that, you know, you have what a lot of people would call an asset light business model, just meaning you're not you're not building the real estate from the ground up to have these scanning offices. You don't own the MRI machines and you're able to take advantages, uh, you take advantage of centers that already have them. So I guess what I'm curious is, you know, was that intentional from day one and how does that work? I'm guessing it's because there are dedicated service centers that just do imaging. And so you can say, Hey, you guys have the MRIs. We can bring the technology and the patients. Talk a little bit about that. Cause I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it was a very deliberate decision. We uh, looked at the space and realized that medical imaging is a really competitive, very commoditized, low margin business. In other words, it's not the you know type of business you want to allocate a lot of capex into and kind of get into if you're not already an established player. In looking at the space, what we also realized is a lot of imaging facilities have remnant inventory. They are not operating at 100% capacity, and therefore we saw a clear opportunity to uh, leverage that. And so the way Ezra works is we partner with the best imaging networks in the country. Our largest partner is RadNet, which is a public company, the largest uh, medical imaging, outpatient medical imaging network in the country. And we buy MRI scanning time from them, we run our protocol and our software and our radiology templates when you go in and get scanned. And then we uh, get all of the images, the reports, and then um, deliver all of the consumer uh, experience. One thing that, that is important to note is that in building a lot of software, we didn't actually just focus on the AI part. We've essentially built an end-to-end cancer screening stack you know, the booking system, the integration with the uh, facilities, we built our own EHR, we built our own report generation system, et cetera, because the current healthcare system is not optimized for a great customer experience. Like even booking a mammogram, which should be the easiest thing, you know, to do, and a woman has to call a facility, stay in line, you know, all of that stuff. 
with Ezra booking a full body scan, it's, it's as easy as booking an Uber. It's not easier. It's like three taps and you're done. And so we believe in increasing access and broadening uh, the ability for people to, to get a scan, not just through making scans faster and creating full bodies and so on, but also by the applying our skills to the underlying technology to actually book and manage and reschedule and, and do all of that stuff. Uh, and we're, we're really proud of what we've done. Well, and it's an important point because all of those things are major inputs into the customer experience, how customers feel going into the appointments, how happy they are having chose Ezra. And again, I think it's another just fascinating example of, I imagine you guys have similar views, but you know, the, just trying to do anything uh, medically, it just feels like you're in the stone ages if you work in technology and use Calendly and use Ubers. You're like, why, why can't it be this simple? <laughs> it Absolutely. And, and here's a crazy stat. There are about 60, 60 million uh, women in the United States who should get a mammogram every year, and only about 40 million are compliant. So you have 20 million women who are not uncompliant with their mammogram screening. I have to believe that part of that is because it's just hard, and they just want, don't want to, you know, they don't have time to, you know, handle the logistics of, of doing that. I mean, we're humans. It's like it's friction. You don't want. <laughs> it should be frictionless, and it should be you know super easy, and you should have all your data in one place. And we need to do better as a as a health system to to get there. And there are many things we're working on at Ezra in order to make all of that stuff better. Well, and I mean, just to say it even more starkly, if you could choose between having that experience to book a car, which is not that high value, and having that experience and the lack of friction to go and do something that's, you know, like you should absolutely be doing for your own health and wellness, like this should exist in healthcare first and foremost, but unfortunately it doesn't, you know, <laughs> to, to take it over from consumer. It's not, but I think we're, we're seeing the early signs of these things being resolved through investments by startups predominantly. I want to ask one kind of big zoom out question, and then I want to end by talking about a few lessons learned. And, you know, the, the question that I want to ask is, Ezra, to me, you know, we've talked about a bunch of things here of going from reactive to proactive healthcare, of people having ownership, of patients being in charge of their healthcare. Um, you know, you mentioned that book, The Patient Will See You Now. Even this idea that you guys are bringing truly deflationary forces with technology into something that is inherently inflationary, that's, that's catastrophically inflationary now. And so, you know, to me, Ezra seems like this fascinating, very very optimistic and exciting glimpse of how healthcare should be. And it's something that maybe feels like it's a, you know, a decade out, probably decades out from rippling out across other areas. I'd be curious for your perspective, if you try to jump forward 10 years, 20 years in time, what do you hope that healthcare starts to feel like? I imagine you probably have some pretty specific ideas. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I started Ezra with a very clear sense of mission. And our mission is to detect cancer early for everyone in the world. And we have this very clear North Star, which is every year about 10 million people find cancer late. And so our mission at Ezra is in a decade to 20 years from now, and I, I personally plan to work on this for the rest of my career, we are finding cancer early for those 10 million people, which means we're screening probably like 100 million people because we're not going to find cancer in every person we screen. And so if we find cancer in 10% of our members, we'll have to screen 10 times more members in order to find cancer early for, for those 10 million people. So that's Ezra. If I zoom out and I look at the healthcare system and healthcare in general and try to kind of draw a line to what I think might be true a decade from now, is I think a much more significant part of healthcare is about preventative care about proactive um, early detection, about holistic kind of approach to healthcare, as opposed to treating people who are already in a chronic disease uh, state. So moving from reactive to proactive and effectively just that, that, that rippling across everything. Well, and this is something that's, you know, come up before where it's like healthcare, I'm sorry, but it's, it's a misnomer today. It's like the way, what it actually is is sick care today. And what you actually want to move to is actual healthcare where you are caring for your health when you're healthy and it, you know, all revolves around proactivity. Yeah. And you know, here's the crazy thing. It's actually a lot simpler to invest in preventative and proactive care than it is to 
treat people who are in kind of various degrees of chronic disease. Like it's much easier to prevent diabetes than to treat diabetes. You know, it's much easier to do a partial surgery for removing a malignant small breast tumor than to do mastectomy plus radio plus chemo. You know, so it is investing in, in preventative care and investing in detection just makes logical sense for a rational individual. And the tools are there, but they're not kind of evenly distributed just yet. And I think we need to uh, invest. Totally. I mean, this may be a silly tangent, but it almost seems like what if we applied healthcare as it exists today to software development? And you said, we're not going to focus on great coding and making, you know, kind of doing all this testing up front. We're going to be kind of lazy there. And we're just going to invest all our resources in handling catastrophic issues when the software fails and when the software goes down. Everyone would be like, what are you doing? This needs to, you know, you need to work way more upstream. <laughs> Why are you taking that approach? 100%. Uh, and I, I feel that somehow, un- unfortunately, the incentives are misaligned in health, uh, healthcare, skewing towards, you know, treating um, treating sick patients instead of preventing disease. But with value based care and everything in that in that in that kind of realm. I think things are getting better on that front. Yeah. yeah. I think as well, just generationally, you also now have, I think of myself and kind of anyone younger, I think they all inherently see and think of their health as something that they need to manage. It's on them. They're tracking it. So it's a very, it's a very different Appreciate the choir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want to end just with a, a, you know, a couple of points talking about what it's been like and some of the lessons you've learned building Ezra. And, and one of the questions I always want to ask for founders listening to this, you know, everyone just building a company is, it's an emotional exercise. You have super high highs, you have super low lows. So I'm curious for you, you know, can, what, what uh, high and what low comes to mind that you've had on the experience building Ezra so far that you'd be open to sharing? Yeah, so the biggest high was when we found cancer for the first patient and that patient reached out to us after having gotten treated and he was like, you saved my life. Actually, the I remember the email that he, he sent me an email directly and the title of the email was Ezra Saved My Life. And then he wrote a, a heartfelt long email about how we saved his life. And that was the, the peak of, of my Ezra experience was that, that very moment. The lowest of the low was when the pandemic hit and we went from scanning, you know, hundreds of people a month to scanning zero people a month because, um, just like facilities were shut down, everything was, was shut down and it was it was hard for the business, but it was also hard because I knew kind of intuitively because of what I do that a lot of people will find cancer late because we're going to have a period of 12, 18 months where nobody's going to get screened uh, or very few people are going to get screened. And as it turns out, you know, we uh, about four or five months into the pandemic, we started scanning people again and everything was fine. But I've started seeing data from... Uh, like the UK, for example, they published a big study showing that late stage breast cancer increased by like 20%, like an astronomical number, because women skipped the mammal cycle. So uh, kind of that moment during the pandemic was was the lowest. I will say, though, kind of there, uh, there's that quote from Elon Musk that I, I, I always come back to, which is like building a startup is like um, staring, uh, chewing glass while staring into the abyss. That's how I feel most days. You know, it's kind of like, I love what we do at Ezra. We're building important things. It's great work and we find cancer for folks, but it's hard. You know, it's like building building a startup, especially building a startup in healthcare is incredibly hard. And so those weekly reminders when we, when we uh, do something good for someone are useful to, to help us keep going. Uh, but most of, 
most of the work that goes into building a startup is just hard work that requires a lot of discipline. And, you know, I think not enough founders talk about that. Yeah. No, it's like the outcomes, uh, you know, finding cancer for people, which is the whole mission of the company is incredibly gratifying, but the work to get there is incredibly dull. <laughs> you have to just do that every day. <laughs> do that every day and wake up and like set the goals and just pursue them. And it's especially hard when you're, when you're doing something incredibly new in a really difficult space. You know, we're trying to literally find cancer for folks with a new technology. So no, I have a lot of, I have a lot of empathy for what what you're going (laughs) to Thank you. I want to ask two more questions. And one of them is, you know, so Ezra is the second company you've built. The first company is, uh, is Brainiant, which we didn't even really cover uh, much except for the intro at the beginning. But one of the questions I want to ask, obviously anybody who is building their second company, I imagine, has things they've learned or ideas about what they want to do differently. Does anything come to mind? And was there anything when you were building Ezra that you were like, very clearly, I'm going to do different the second time around? Yes. So um, the nice thing about being a second time founder is it's easier to raise money because you have the credibility, you've made money for investors, investors trust you. That part was significantly easier uh, in Ezra than it was in Brainiant. The learnings part i learned and we've done a great job with that at ezra that it's really important to have a strong sense of mission you know with brainiant the kind of mission was i gotta make some money because otherwise i have no money you know and that that was the goal so there was no kind of strong sense of mission that would rally the troops and get everyone excited with ezra we do have this mission we all care about it it's really important so i think as far as some insight for founders is like pursue because startups are about chewing glass while staring into the abyss you really want to care about the thing that's getting you to chew so much glass you know because if you don't care about the thing it's not worth it there are many other ways to to make money that are probably uh, that, that require less glass chewing you know so I think it's it's really important to have a strong thing that you care about, that you want to invest in, that you're willing to go through great depths of, of pain to to pursue. I think that's my, <laughs> doesn't sound like a, a very uh, exciting thing, but that's my biggest uh, insight in, uh, in, in, in kind of, I guess, piece of advice that I have for founders, like choose something that they really, really care about. Yeah. And then thread that needle and and, and build a mission-driven company and hire people for that and have that be the rallying cry. Yes, exactly. That really makes it easier to find the right team and and get the team rallied towards the uh, short-term goals. Yeah. I would consider Ezra to be incredibly successful. And I know you guys are still early in your, you know, in kind of the existence of the company. As you said, you want to work on this problem for the rest of your life. One of the questions that, you know, I find fascinating um, and I like to ponder about different businesses. And so I'd love to ask you is if you had to point to one decision, one reason why Ezra has been so successful, what would you put your finger on? Meaning if you had to try to boil down just, you know, the trajectory of the company into one thing, what would that be? Yeah, so it's quite counterintuitive, but I think our biggest strength has been the fact that I am an outsider to the healthcare system. Because anyone, any insider would have come and said, and and come with a set of like preconceptions that would have prevented them from pursuing things in the same way I did. Like I went with a direct consumer approach with, a new uh, way to scan people with a modality that had not really been used before for screening and with a new kind of type of business model, all, you know, for serving my goal. But I I was, I guess, a little bit naive about like all of the different things. And that was a good thing at the end of the day. So I think the fact that I pursued a, a domain that was where I didn't start with a insider info served us really well and actually i think that's uh, a lot of times you see founders going into very new spaces and succeeding because of the fresh eyes on the problem well and you know i think the way you broke it down there of all the decisions that you made that were very counter to how somebody would have made those decisions inside, I think totally proved the point because those are one-way doors. You're going to make those decisions once and it's either going to work or it's not. 
and you know you happen to make a very different set. Yeah, hundred percent. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on, Emmy. Um, and I highly encourage you know if you have any uh, closing remarks, feel free to share them. But I highly encourage everyone to go and check out Ezra and and, and consider getting a screening if they hadn't had one already. I think that if I am to have an ending remark, it would be to not smoke, exercise, and get screened. <laughs> the three things, the three things to do coming the out of this, this, interview. Interview. Of this interview. Daniel, this was super fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on, Emmy. I appreciate Thank it. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more about Ezra and how to get screened for cancer at Ezra.com. And you can follow Emmy Gall on Twitter at Emmy Gall. That's at E-M-I-G-A-L. You can find a searchable transcript for this episode as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper into the topics we've covered today at outlieracademy.com slash 146. That's outlieracademy.com slash 146. For more from Outlier Academy, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at cheatsheetnewsletter.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have all of our interviews that we've ever released as well as our favorite clips from every episode at youtube.com slash outlier academy or visit outlieracademy.com for more incredible outlier founder episodes profiling incredible companies like Forward, 8sleep, Common Stock, Varda Space Industries, Superhuman, Primal Kitchen, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and many, many more. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they use to build these incredible companies. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode of Outlier Academy next Wednesday.